I am, my name is John Roderick, and I am a Seattle musician and uh, a notable interactive personality. <laughs> I use interactive technologies to further my business on the internet. And I have brought together this panel of famous internet p entertainers to discuss the internet. Let's go down the line and meet our panelists. <laughs> Come back here. We lost one. We lost one. <laughs> he's just getting something to read. <laughs> he, he, oh, wait. He's bringing, he's bringing the internet up here. Is this, our, is this our gift bag? Oh, thank you very much. Good. Good. This is essential for our progress here. I need a bell. While you unwrap, can I say, can I say my name, John? Uh, yes, you have, uh, you have 30 seconds to say your name and tell people who you are. Uh, my name is Scott Simpson. I, uh, for the last 12 years, have been working at, uh, at Amazon and then at Apple, and left recently to do some creative projects. Um, these four showed up in a stand up van. comedy. He's trying to be That's a stand up true. comedy. I'm trying to do, do stand up comedy, but I don't want to say really, it. Yet. It's really depressing when you think about it. Isn't it is. <laughs> I asked you guys, I said, I said, should I do it? You said, yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, because it would be hilarious for us. <laughs> right, well, right. You're the only one of us here that was actually vested in the stock program at his job. So. That's true. That's true. It was, uh, so yeah, that's, that's where I am in my life right now. I've, I've left a, a, a successful job to be deeply unsuccessful. We'll see how it goes. Hashtag failure. Game change. <laughs> game change number one. That's right. Change number one. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's switch over to game change number two. Hi, I'm Merlin Mann, and I'm uh, changing the game uh, interactively. Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, I can talk to you, and you can't really talk to me, and sh shouldn't yet, but if you have questions, I mentioned John will take those. I, uh, I do things on the internet. Um, I'm still kind of working that out, uh, and I do different projects with these guys, but mostly I make uh, poop and dick jokes on the internet, and <laughs> it's uh, nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, game change number two. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. No, you didn't. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Colton. I'm also here to change some games. Uh, I, uh, like Scott, left a perfectly good job as a professional person uh, to be unsuccessful in the arts. Uh, uh, I'm now a musician and uh, singer-songwriter. Uh, I, can, I can help you, Scott, with this transition because I made the same transition Thank you. Back in 2005, before we had the internet, so. When you say help me, was this when you offered me the other, the other spot on the queen size bed in the back of your van? Yeah, okay. If, if you need it. Okay. If you really need it, you can sleep there. He's Thank gonna you. pay you $150 to open for him every night. Thank That's you. right. Thank you. <laughs> Hashtag passive aggressive. <laughs> Hashtag aggressive aggressive. <laughs> and then, uh, you there at the end. Game, oh, that was game change. Get the bell ready, here we go. No, wait. Do, 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 do. Game yeah. change number one, three now. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm John Hodgman. Um, I, uh, for a long time, was a literary agent who decided that I wanted to be a writer, and I saw opportunities online to cultivate an audience by writing a, uh, a humorous advice column for McSweeney's. At that time, I was saying to Jonathan Colton, man, you gotta quit your job and do the thing that you were meant to do. You're an amazing musician. Stop wasting your time as a computer programmer. The internet is going to change everything. And Jonathan eventually listened to me and use the internet to change his life, whereas I got kidnapped by television and now work in the oldest of old media, uh, doing television on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and a, a series of television advertisements that are now over. <laughs> so in a, sen in a sense, I thought I was going to use interactive technology to change my career and nurture an audience online, and, uh, and, and, and yet what happened was I made, I made, I, I, I got an audience the old-fashioned way, captively, via television, and then, and I thought, well, that's ironic, and now the game has changed for me in that my television advertisements are over, 
and I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, and I'm asking these gentlemen to come up with something for and me. And that's why you're here. Maybe stand-up comedy. <laughs> No, Maybe I would Scott never Simpson. do that. I would never do that. It is a, that is a hopeless, soul-killing job. <laughs> that, that actually is not a job at all. It is, it is a weird alcoholic hobby that some people take up <laughs> as they what? travel across the world trying, trying to make people who hate themselves laugh. So the five of us have a variety of different jobs, but we all use social media. But at the same time, we're all... We're all pretty agnostic about social media at the same time. This is one of those questions that John Roderick asks with great, where he poses with great certainty uh, a fact that we are all agnostic about social media, when what he's really saying is, I am very agnostic about social media and I'd like to talk about it. So let me turn that around on you, John. I am the what moderator of this panel, sir. What do you, <laughs> we shall see. What do you mean? <laughs> What do you mean when you say you are agnostic about social media? Because that's a thing that you just said on local morning television. That's right. And I didn't know what you were talking about it's my then, new and catchphrase. I still don't know. It's my new catchphrase. I'm yeah, we're, right now we up. are currently live on New Day Northwest, which I think is a, a TV show that they are making. Uh, they're banking episodes for after uh, the civilization collapses. <laughs> Or uh, at, I think it may be the first, the first post-rapture morning talk show, New Day Northwest, sounds very <laughs> creepy to me. And you said you were agnostic about social media, and I didn't know what you meant, and I didn't want to embarrass you on television. I'm going to watch New Day Northwest on my phone while you're asking this question. Fantastic. <laughs> but what do, you, what do you mean by that, actually? Seriously. Well, I, I mean that social media is, is presented as kind of a, a like, a, it, it, in some ways, it, it was suggested that we do this panel because our careers take place on social media or they're a major factor uh, in our lives, but, uh, or in, in the way that we're now presenting ourselves to the world. But at the same time, I, I don't think I'm speaking for myself when I say that there are aspects of big, big chunks of what people think constitutes socially interacting with people, uh, with our audience, that we are ambivalent about or in well, fact okay. hostile that's, yeah, to. Yeah, that's a word, because social media agnostic would suggest that maybe you don't know whether or not it exists and you don't care. Stop nitpicking my words. <laughs> well, that is, nitpicking your words is the essence of all social media. You understand? I, like, <laughs> <laughs> Save it for the comment page. Thumbs down. No, I think, I think, First, I'm, I think I'm contrasting social media agnostic against social media evangelist. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so yeah. stick that in your pie hole. Right, okay. <laughs> like you're, you're like a Unitarian. You're going to church and reading the New York Times. Uh, yeah. I, right? You, you do good works in the world, and you have your own relationship with Christ, but you're not out there trying to tell people yeah, and how, the, to, how the, to think The minister be. at our church plays an acoustic guitar. Right, exactly so. All right. And is, is ambig, ambiguously but you, sexual. You are, but, but, you, but I think you actually are more than agnostic. I think that you are ambivalent, deeply so, about social media. What would you say is the pro and the con of your relationship to humans on Twitter? And I pose this to all of you as the moderator. <laughs> You're so mad right now. I'm so mad. I'm so mad. <laughs> I'm going to dock you $50 for every time you try and take over this panel. Uh, I would say... Uh, I have the money. The, the <laughs> not for long. Uh, I, I think that maybe it's, uh, some of that is a factor of, of my age, uh, that I am, um, that, a, that ambivalence is a result of having spent years uh, building my career in a sort of pre-social media way, and it's very difficult for me to abandon uh, print media and, uh, and terrestrial radio and, um, and also the distance that I used to be able to maintain from my audience. That, Which you uh, enjoyed very much. Well, or that I used to think was necessary. Well, uh, you are a professional rock star, and as such, a certain amount of distance is kind of expected as part of that job description, I think. But you are a modern internet rock star who cultivates a kind of access, uh, accessibility and closeness with the, our audience, your audience, and it's suggested that maybe you are the future and I am the past. I'll, I'll, I'll second that suggestion. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, you know, for me, the, the, I think, I think in, 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 how many people here know who Jonathan Colton is? So about 50%, right? 
So for those of the 50% who do not know who you are, will you give them just a little pricey about what happened in your life and, and, and why you are successful? Right. So in 2005, I left my software job and started a project called Thing a Week, where I released a new song every Friday for a year. Uh, had a couple of... I heard the gentlest woo out there. The gentlest woo. Woo. Um, <laughs> or it might be one of the crazy owls they have hanging around this conference. Uh, are, there, are there alive owls here? That's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the not mascot just... of Seattle Interactive Conference. Yeah. Oh my God. Don't uh, look them in the you, eye. If you find one, you could win an iPad. <laughs> Uh, but I had a couple of viral uh, successes over that year, and uh, I uh, was blogging about the whole thing and, and hopped on Twitter when that came along and, and spent a lot of time uh, cultivating the idea that I was uh, doing this independently and experimentally. And, you know, I, I, as all the new services that we, we now see all over the Internet designed to uh, fill in the gaps as the music industry dies, uh, as those new services were coming up, I would try them out and, uh, and try to figure out the most efficient way to tour and the, and the uh, easiest, you know, the, the cheapest way to make t-shirts and make them available for people. And, and so uh, over the course of a few years, I uh, got to the point where I'm, I am, you know, making a living this way and I don't have a record label. And, uh, and you never will. And I, I probably never will. That's right. true. Yeah. And the other thing that you did was that you, when you released the songs, you released them under a Creative Commons license so that people could essentially play along with you and make videos of your songs right. and cover them and, and sort of spread them themselves. So all the songs were published for free but also made available in a, in a store. Uh, and, yeah, the Creative Commons license, you know, I, I spent a lot of time encouraging people to participate in what I was doing by making other things. And I found this to be incredibly distasteful and hateful. And I remember many times in 2005 and six counseling you, will you please stop answering those emails from your fans? They are wasting your time and sucking your blood. You should be a rock star like John Roderick and not give a hoot about them. That's an owl reference. Yeah. That's but right, a rock star who rides, rides along in his white Hummer limousine and never rolls the windows down. Yeah, exactly so, and, you, and you said no to me. I'm going to answer the, okay. Sorry, you're done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Merlin Mann uh, uh, was the first person to suggest to me that I needed a website. This was 10 years ago or more, and I had a band. I thought you were going to say that was in May. <laughs> <laughs> that was 10 years ago or more. Uh, I had a band that was touring the, the States the old-fashioned way in a, in a van, and uh, Merlin said, you guys don't have a website. You really should have one, and I, I remember calling you on the phone and saying, uh, can you explain to me why I would want a website? That was, uh, it was right before, so When I Pretend to Fall was 2003, yeah. maybe. But it was fun. I started making websites uh, mostly for a living in 1995, and a big part of my job, and I just, there just aren't enough air quotes for that, but th part of my job in 1995, these chairs are, all of Seattle's chairs make me feel like a child. Uh, the, um, would you like a phone book? <laughs> could I, do you guys can we have, have a yellow books? pages? <laughs> Uh, but it started, even starting in 1995, there were, you had to make a case f with people for why they would want it. There were certain kinds of people even back then. I told this story on some podcast before about a guy who wanted to hire me to make a website where he could drop ship carpeting to your house. I would scan the brochure and, you know, all ladies, right? This is how you buy carpeting. You go and you see a picture this big and say, please drop ship it to my house and I guess I'll figure out how to get it installed. That's what the web was in 1995. Didn't take that project. But even then, you had to tell people, like, what's the value behind this? Who will use this? And in John's case, he had a record coming out, which I think was probably some part of it. But I kind of had to make the case because John was, if I may say, at that time, not a big consumer of the web. And I, I, as I like to say, you know, every social media thing or website or anything or video game seems stupid if you're not using it. And it seems really stupid, really, until your friends are using it, too. So whether that's Twitter. That's to me when it seems the most stupid. Yeah. Like I might be interested in something until I find friends. out that you guys are doing it. Right. And I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> like, what is this thing you tried to get me to join? Glassboard? Oh, Glassboard. Board. Come oh. on. It's great. No, if, I know no, you it's probably confusing. all made it. There's a button. I know. It's just like, uh, but there, there is an old man aspect to me, which is like another thing now. Yeah, that I have yeah. to... There's a fatigue. There's totally a fatigue to yeah. that. And in John's case, I mean, I think you, my sense is that you are circumspect about 
at the time, even we had a message board for you. I, I was giving everybody, it was Vander Slice, everybody was getting, you got to have a message board. And you were circumspect about how much time you should spend there, how often you should pop in and, you know, explain things. Well, the conventional wisdom in 2003 was still don't go on your own message board and talk to fans there because it will, it will uh, ruin your you mystique. You lose the proscenium effect in yeah. a lot of ways. And it was... Only a few years later, when you, John Hodgman, in contravention of what you just said, were trying to convince me to join Twitter because it was this super fun place where all your friends were having a super fun time. And I didn't want to join Twitter either because it seemed like Glassboard. Again, no offense if you are the CEO of Glassboard. <laughs> is the CEO of Glassboard here? Uh, but Do any of you know what that is? No, he's not. How many people of you know, know what Glassboard is? There the hands go up. All right. Well, but when, how many of you will just when, raise when your as hand many for people in the audience, <laughs> Seven, When as many people eight. in the audience know about Glassboard as know about Jonathan Colton, then I might take a look at it. But, but it was, it was uh, Jonathan Colton and I were walking through L.A. and uh, we parked our car somewhere to go get Thai food. We weren't walking through L.A., let me correct myself. We were driving through L.A. and we parked our car to get Thai food and when we came out, the car had been towed. And we were in a strange town and neither of us knew where to find the car or even where to, where to start. And Jonathan said, you know, you keep saying that Twitter is stupid and that, that you're never going to join it. But let me tell you, if I tweeted right now that we were stranded on the side of the road here, we would have someone here in five minutes willing to drive us to wherever the cars go. In their white, and in their white you. van. <laughs> <laughs> you should get in the back. <laughs> Yeah, could you help me get this uh, couch into the back of my van? <laughs> I, I, I broke my arm. Can you help me move this? Oh. <laughs> the Northwest is actually where that uh, that meme that well, helped me get my boat on my what, top of my. What are you, Johnny? Being... <laughs> you about would you would be, if I wore you, you'd be a 16 or an 18, probably. <laughs> but in any case, I mean, in each in each instance, my own uh, adaptation or uh, adoption of new social media technology has been a result of one of the people up here on the dais, explaining to me why it was essential for my career. And Glassboard is where I draw the fucking line. Well, that's, and if I could say something, that's, that's one of the challenges, I think, especially when you started something, you get in, let's say, via Twitter, um, or before then, via whatever it is. Um, suddenly, three, three years down the line, there are 19 new services that you're supposed to sign up for, and uh, it feels even more fragmented than it ever has been. And I think that's part of the part of the overall kind of feeling uh, that I think all of us have felt in the last probably two or so years, as uh, as as kind of everybody joins Twitter, as it becomes this kind of crazy just churn of of information and promotion and links and junk, um, and Facebook kind of goes in that direction as well. And there are all these new services that just kind of do that too. And and I think. Pro probably one of the problems is that it is so popular and it is so mass adopted now that it is harder to uh, to say, Jonathan, if you were starting out your thing now, is if you're doing your podcast, which I saw from the other side because I was working on the podcast section of the iTunes store at that time, um, that was really cool and awesome and nobody else was doing it. But now every professional musician and every professional um, writer every semi-literate person in the United States has a podcast. Has a podcast, now. yeah. Well, it and just every, came out every, this morning. I don't know if you saw that statistic. And every professional uh, radio personality has a podcast as well. I mean, you know, when I was starting in these in these media, I I wasn't competing with you know I, I wasn't competing with Ashton Kutcher on Twitter, and now I am. Say it's a, say, it's a, say, it's a say Kutcher again. Say Kutcher again. Kutcher. It's cute. Kutcher. It's cute. Is it Kutcher? I say Kutcher. I say, say Kutcher. I say Kutcher. Kuchi? I say Kutcher. Kutcher. It's Ashton. I think it's I call, Ashton Kutcher. I call him the Kutch. The, the Kutch. Kutch. Yeah. Well, it's because you're best friends with him. <laughs> no, but I mean, now, now all of these, uh, you know, all of these platforms have become really noisy on many levels, not just because uh, now every amateur in the world has access to them, but because every, you know, they were so effective uh, in, in making things happen that all the professional uh, industries have gravitated toward them as well. So it's, it's incredibly hard now, these days. I remember in 2008, there were, I was having uh, dinner with, a, with, a, uh, with a, uh, an entrepreneur uh, who may be sitting in this room and said to me that he was going to start a company that would help celebrities manage their social media. At this point, I had been on Twitter, this may have been 2000, I think this was 2008, late 2008, I'd been on Twitter for about nine months. 
And I really, as crankful as I come across about all this stuff, I always, like the, the, the experience with McSweeney's was a revelation to me because suddenly I was in conversation with an audience and I knew immediately this was both creatively rewarding to me and also a new way for writers to reach audiences and Twitter felt the same way to me. And he said he was gonna create a company um, that would allow bona fide uh, international and uh, national level celebrities. Like the Kutch. Like the Kutch to manage social media because it takes up a lot of time. And, and you signed up with his company and they would create a Facebook page, a Twitter page, uh, 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 and then he listed off like nine different social media networks that exist only in Brazil that I didn't know about. And I said that, to him, uh, I You think got Face Jam, <laughs> you, you got Block Block, <laughs> you got uh, Murder Force, uh, Jerk Store, Abrogado, abrogado. Plax, plax batagado. You've got uh, Chiroscura, which is popular. Uh, is that the kind of painting or the steak? No, which that's, one the, is that? that's the painting, yeah. You're thinking uh, of... Uh, Joaquin Carrasco. Of, you have uh, ca capoeira, but it's spelled without any vowels. Right. Cabo Wabo. It's, yeah. Capoeira, capoeira is, is the social network where you act like you're dancing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're yeah, dancing it's, and it's then it's someone kicks you in the face. Is, yeah. It's a social network that is secretly also a martial art. <laughs> Because the peasants weren't allowed, they could only have social media. They weren't allowed to train. And is what I right? said, and what I said to him at the time is, I think, uh, as I have said to every successful entrepreneur that I have ever met, who then went on to make millions and millions of dollars, you're which a is, fool. Which is all of them, yeah, right? You've you're met a them fool, all. and it will never work. And the reason I said it was that I, knowing from Jonathan's experience, to me it felt like the whole point of this was the people who are using social media felt they were having an authentic interaction with the person on the other end of the horn, as it were, and the moment that people would sense inauthenticity on the other side of the Twitter feed or the Facebook or whatever, they would go away in disgust. And what I didn't know then was that I was describing what I thought was the world, but was actually a really narrow band of internet sort of enthusiasts and cranks who do get very upset about that stuff, whereas the rest of the world, they're not looking for an authentic experience at all. They're very happy with an inauthentic experience with their, with their favorite international celebrities. Yeah, it's the punk rock fallacy that everyone who follows punk rock thinks that everybody cares about authenticity and legitimacy. Right. But in fact, no one does. And I remember the day that Stephen Fry uh, hit 100,000 followers on Twitter and, you know, as far as, we, as, as I was concerned, he had broken the sound barrier. It will not go beyond this. Do you know what I mean? hundred, and even he was like, how, how could it get better than this? And then, and then Ashton Kutcher, the Kutch came along and, uh, and went on, of all things, Larry King live to say, I'm on Twitter now. Wow. And it's like, that to me was the tipping point. Perfect storm. Yeah, exactly. This is like, and now they do a I'm going to tell, together. I'm going to tell this ancient mummy on television. <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, that I'm using this now, and suddenly, and suddenly the the whole landscape, the whole ecosystem changed completely. And those of us who were, you know, minor or you know, sort of known personalities on Twitter and no, those early adopters. Right word. Yeah, right. Minor. But I mean, like your Stephen Fry's, your Leo Laporte's, your tech people who had had a whole audience unto themselves on Twitter, and then the, the few of us who got on early and sort of made a name for themselves, suddenly just were fucking yeah. stomped on by Rihanna. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think, um, I think Arby's horsey sauce has 250,000 Twitter followers now. <laughs> Arby's is like 5 million. That is good sauce. Horsey sauce. That is good sauce. Tons. Though. Well, it's a, you know what? It's a great Twitter it's feed. A good so sauce. let's look at why that Twitter feed works. Bring up the first slide, please. <laughs> Uh, but, but in fact, now we find, for instance, we're, we're doing a show tonight uh, that is this same group of people, except with a lot less John Hodgman and a lot more other people. <laughs> we'll see, uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I find that we all now uh, have, although uh, we're members of a half a dozen different social media outlets, uh, each of us, and uh, social media is supposedly exploding, we're all... Uh, s struggling to find a way to promote this show that isn't simply tweeting about it and then hoping that someone retweets it. Like, in a way, social media is exploding and also constricting at the same time because I'm, I'm watching the feeds of people that I enjoy, I, I like their work, and when their feed starts to fill up with, come to my show, I just close down. I'm well, I was, I was saying to Scott this morning, I think that, that we've all gotten pretty adept at skipping over the parts of our feed that we know are not content. 
And so, you know, when it's, it, because it, 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 uh, it has gotten very noisy and filled with links and, and, and pluggy stuff. So as you, as you scroll through, you see a link and your, your eyes just kind of naturally skip over it. Right. And this, this also, I think, gets to the, the basic disconnect, which is that, for, well, first of all, the underlying thing of it depends on how you arrived at the medium. Um, so if you arrived at the medium because you were aware of internet culture and you started having a podcast for fun, and then that became a thing, um, th that's pretty different from saying, well, the Today Show needs to have a podcast now. Neither one of those is right or wrong, and that's part of the, not the disconnect, but maybe the paradox, is that the reason people, this is obvious, but it needs to be said, which is that everybody who gets into this gets into this for their own reasons, is a, a publisher uh, or a participant, you know, in and broadcasting these things. But on the other hand, you also have to account for the fact that as your audience grows, it's uh, going to become much more diffuse in how familiar people are with you and what you do apart from that one place, as well as what they expect out of it. So for example, uh, a show that I'm on, we recently sold t-shirts uh, having to do with our podcast. And uh, I, I was really resistant to like talking about it all the time, even though that's like how I partly make a living is selling stuff like that. And so I felt at a certain point I was really burning myself out and burning people out. Hopefully I wasn't too bad at it. But even at that point when I had all these fears that I was going to uh, be off-putting to people because I don't want to be that guy, there were still people two weeks later who were like, why didn't you tell me you were telling, selling T-shirts? So I failed at reaching those people on the one hand, while on the other hand, I really, I, I probably failed at what I believe is the value of not shoving stuff down people's throat just because yeah. you have the bully pulpit to do it. We all, we all, I think, proceed from a place of sort of, uh, of sort of um, artistic reticence to do that sort of stuff and to cultivate. We, we we came from it from the point of view of we're cultivating, we're cultivating an audience, and so we need to be transparent and fair and fair dealers with them and not shove stuff at them all the time, but I think the landscape has changed to some degree where that audience uh, is much larger and they're going to miss it if we're not straightforward about what we're doing, and there's a reason that everyone remembers head-on apply directly to the forehead, because they would show that ad all the time and say those words nine times, head-on, apply directly to the forehead, head-on, apply directly to the forehead, head-on, apply directly to the forehead. Was that just an East Coast thing, or are you people not no, aware it's, of head-on, it apply directly to the forehead? And, and unfortunately, it's like, sometimes I feel like now it's my job to, right. to do head-on, apply directly to the forehead. Well, Showbox tonight, show tonight at 8 p.m. Showbox tonight at 8 p.m. Showbox tonight at 8 p.m. Six years ago, when I, when I released a, an album, I counted on a team of people to promote that album. And the, and the idea was that if you heard the record on the radio, you read a magazine article about it, you saw it in your local alternative weekly, your friends were talking about it, and then you heard it on the radio again, that you know, building up that number of impressions was the way that you eventually pushed someone into a local record store to buy your album. And now, uh, we were all very smug a couple of years ago about how all that stuff doesn't matter anymore and print media is dead and record stores are dead and everything is dead except social media. But now we're, you know, I personally feel that I'm up against this social media membrane where it's like, Everybody's too good at ignoring, you know, you go to a website and there's, an, there's a flash ad at the top going, buy John Roderick's new record, and you, your, mind, your mind has... You're welcome, by the way. Yeah, I spent you. a lot of money on those Thanks ads. for paying for that. Do you, do, you, do you guys feel like you can trust uh, somebody who has those socks? These socks? <laughs> like, do you feel like you can trust his advice on social media? We've got socks that are well, still you know, in jail. Listen, I'm, a fl I'm a flamboyant artist. We all, we, all, we all were able to change our careers to one way or another by finding an audience online and finding new, not just a new audience and a new livelihood, but a new, new inspiration. And I guess, you know, we've all talked a lot about the, the good old days or bad old days of what it was, but since Jonathan Colton knew before I did how it was going to work, what do you see as the future now for you to maintain or, well, let's put it this way. Let's say you were going to give advice to someone who was going to change their career today in the current landscape. What would be the most effective way to do it? Uh, you know, I, I think that it, <laughs> the, what you say is true. I think a couple of years ago, 
we were. I don't want to hear about a couple of years ago anymore. I'm talking no, no, about the no. future. Listen, let me let me finish what I'm saying though. A couple of years ago, we were all riding yeah, high, and now and now we're and now we're sort of back to where we started, which is that it's a noisy landscape, and uh, the same way you needed for somebody to see a magazine article, hear the song on the radio, uh, and see you on television in order for them to buy the record. I think you still need multiple hits. It's just that the, the, the now social, social media is part of that landscape. And I would say that the advice hasn't really changed all that much. You need to make a thing that is good and, and get it out there in as many ways as possible and hope that it finds an audience. I don't, I don't, think, there's a, you know, I don't think there's a magic bullet. Uh, there may have been in 2007, some, somewhere halfway between 2007 and 2008, but... But I, I guess my question is, uh, I mean, the, uh, if I have a, if I post about it on Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, and MySpace, and uh, Glassbox, aren't uh, those things? Those things, at one level, appear to be five different venues, but at another level, they're all really just one venue, which is you're on the internet and you're clicking through your normal websites, and you see it's. It's not like you hear it five different places. But it's also a difference. That's something I wanted to say from earlier is that, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, we're all we're talking about this in terms of really publishing. You know, the you know, the newspaper doesn't yell back at you when you yell at the newspaper. And so from a certain standpoint, when you think of it as a Speak broad for yourself. When you think of it as a broadcast medium, uh, it's easy. Anything involving online stuff, especially things like Twitter, this was true back in the day when I started blogging. It, it, you get inside a bubble where you start to think that you know all all of what you know and all of what you follow has this positive feedback loop to it, and it starts seeming sane because you hear so many people talking about it. And if you don't take it in the context of other things, it can all sound a little bananas. The other thing, though, is that truthfully, so it seems to me the vast majority of people, especially on Twitter, I'm not on Facebook, but the vast majority of people on Twitter are there talking to their friends and their friends are talking to them. If you go and look at most people's feeds, they'll have a certain end number of followers and most of it's at responses back and forth with a, hand, with a handful of people. That's how most people use Twitter as a publisher, if you like, is to talk to their friends back and forth. And so the, the only thing about you know putting it on Google Plus and doing it on this, well, to me, another way to look at that from most consumers' point of view is, well, you're really are you starting five different conversations that you intend to keep up with? In other words, you know, you wouldn't run from room to room in here and go, you know, how's everybody doing? And then run away without hearing what each person had to say. And I think that's where it starts to ring a little, not untrue, but a little, little it clangs a little bit sour with people when you only use it as a way if you make it look like a conversation, but then don't converse with people, I think that's what starts to make people think it feels a little plastic. Personally, on Twitter, like I, I've, I, I, it's been hard for me to use it as a conversation medium for a long time because it's just not how I converse. But I, I, I don't feel bad about using it as a, as a publishing medium. People seem to enjoy it. But if I said to people, "Hey, what are y'all having for breakfast today?" My new album comes out on Tuesday. Like I would sound like a, like a dick, you know, because I don't really care what you had for breakfast. But if I made it look like that, you could be authentic, however you want to be, as long as that's who you want to be. The problem is if you start thinking in this old school way of like, well, PR blasts. Hey, this is an inexpensive medium I can use to jam shit down a lot of people's throat. Pardon me. At the same time. Well, then that's, you know, you're going to get the listeners that you deserve. But if you treat it as a platform, I'll shut up in a minute, a platform where you're making something that's amusing on its own, if you can take the audience you know you get that's a little nerdier on Google+, and make it a fun nerd thing, if you make it a little bit more palatable to a broader audience for your many followers on Twitter, you're going you're gonna to be more successful than somebody who does nothing but defecate a long list of links to where I'll, I'll be playing at Sir Laffington's this weekend, come on out to the show. It's just, it's just who you want to be and identifying with what your audience is looking for, I think, regardless of what level you're playing at. What do you think, Scott? Are you at Sir Laffington's too? <laughs> yeah, actually, if you guys uh, I don't mind uh, telling you, I'm going to be at uh, J. Sir Giggling Gigglington's. I'll finish later. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. Uh, the one thing that I would say that I think um, I saw you know, back at my, my, my old job in, in digital media was... Uh, and it still is true, and I think probably is more true, given, given the fact that so many more people are, are creating podcasts, so many more people are, are on Twitter, is to just be incredibly direct and clear as quickly as possible with what your deal is, what your message is. Um, in like 2006, I think, um, maybe even earlier, 
uh, when I was at iTunes, there were two podcasts that were launched in the same week. One was David Lee Roth's podcast, which seemed like it was going to be a, a sure thing and a big deal. And then the other one was uh, this what show. What made you possibly think that? <laughs> you know why? Because, because Diamond Dave. There was there was like no famous people were doing it, right? So even that kind of name. And there still wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to introduce you to my friend David Lee Roth. And the other podcast was was this show called Ask a Ninja, which nobody knew. It just launched out of nowhere, and uh, and it was it was brilliantly done. The guys who put that together are super funny and smart. But more important, uh, no one would probably have ever clicked through if it if the graphic had been some sort of slick, uh, you know, fancy thing, and the show had been called, you know, like. Shigeru speaks or whatever, you know, if it had been sort of hidden behind layers of, of uh, coyness or wit, uh, it wouldn't have gotten through. And that took off like crazy. And David Lee Roth's, as, as you obviously could have predicted, didn't do well. I lost a lot of money in that podcast. <laughs> you were long Roth, short ninja, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, uh, the, 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 the internet, see, and, and, and we've all, uh, everybody in this room has consumed massive quantities of the Kool-Aid about the internet, but it seems to me that the internet still is at the level, uh, as I've said before, that, the, uh, that aviation was when airplanes were still being powered by bicycle motors. Like our, our, our devices are not fast enough and the internet is still figuring itself out in a way that, in a way that necessitates that you and I go on New Day Northwest this morning to promote our tech show that, and, and the technical conference that we're attending. Like, it is not sufficient to have a career where the internet, where it exists entirely on the internet. See, you may be, you may be social media agnostic, but I, but I am, I'm veering into social media beginning to realize he's an atheist and wants to go. <laughs> Do something terrible. No, to you know, I, I I love it online. But in the sense, in the sense that, what I what I feel I discovered, watching my Twitter feed grow, was that people in a crowd of about twenty, you know, like two thousand to twenty five thousand, are very actively engaged, and they love what you're saying. They have a relationship with you. You can tell them to go pick you up in Los Angeles, and they will show up and not murder you. Once, if you if you hit a you crowd larger, enough, you'll be able to choose. When, right, when but if you hit a crowd, one. when when I got on a list of recommended users for Twitter, such that people were automatically signing up for me without any idea of who I was, suddenly that crowd grew to 250,000 and beyond. Now those original 25,000 people are still there, right? But in a crowd of that size, they don't feel engaged, and suddenly what was an interactive medium becomes. As as passive a broadcast medium as watching New Day Northwest. I don't know if and it's I, and, and, I don't and know worse it, than not being able to get someone to pick me up in a car and murder me is I can't get anyone to pick me up in a car at all. I would suggest that it is not that twenty five thousand people who changed, but that when you started to see that you had seven hundred and fifty thousand followers, your Twitter feed changed and became and you were now assuming that you were speaking to all these people. Well, and I have so the transcript were... of my Twitter feed from the past seven years here. You can take a look. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think so. I mean, I was trying to play the exact same games. I use Twitter not for reasons of commerce. I use Twitter be, for the precise reason that I never use Facebook. To me, Twitter is a fun tool that I enjoyed using. Facebook for me was, and it's nothing against Facebook, I just, it just didn't connect with my brain in the same way Twitter did. Uh, and so I would use it in the exact same way, and I said, started noticing nothing coming back. That's and clearly not true. You use your Twitter feed now exclusively to link to your Tumblr. Well, that was Damn. a change. <laughs> but that, Booyah! But that was a change. <laughs> ab, ab, absolutely, but that was, that was a change that I made not at the time that I got on that list and got all those followers and saw that everyone... You're rationalizing now. You're so mad at me <laughs> moderating your moderation panel. <laughs> Let's ask Jonathan I, Colton what he thinks. We have, we have 10 minutes. Oh, we have 10 minutes. Right. Maybe, we should, uh, maybe we should take some questions from the audience. Maybe I, I should would, take some questions from the audience. Fine. Are there any uh, audience members who have questions for this illustrious panel? There's a microphone right there and there if you'd like to come step up to it. And if not, I'm going to, you know what, I'm just going to do this Donahue style. What is he doing? <laughs> I, I, John Hodgman, I want to direct your attention to this giant screen here. Yeah, where, author, where my name has slash, moderator. Slash actor. <laughs> two slashes. 
Yes, ma'am, what is your question? First, what is your, what is your name? My name is Kelsey, and I'm with Writerly. And I'm wondering if someone is... Easy on the, on the buzz marketing, please. <laughs> I'm wondering if someone has been offline for a long time, maybe writing a novel, and they want to get online, how do you enter now? How do you enter when you don't have a, a presence already? Do you That's what I tried a... to ask Jonathan, and he wouldn't answer. Do you have a, do you have a, 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 a very photogenic penis? <laughs> I just Great I have question. to ask that first. Not today. Do, do you have okay. access yeah, yeah. to I, a great I, photogenic piece? You have to ask that first because everything else is really, really hard after that. Also, it helps if you take a photo from up here. But that's a great question. Everybody up on the dais here was an early adopter of these technologies and so is grandfathered in. How do you, how do you join I, this I, conversation? I think it's a, a, a really interesting and, and, and difficult question, especially if you take all of this as being like a big of kind of the same thing, which it's really not. It's all faces. All this stuff is made out of people. I don't think it's that different to, to, to toot out to this many versus that many. It's going to be what I want to say, and if they don't like it, they can leave. And that has gotten me more followers than going, hey, guys, nice shirt. So in your case... If you, assuming you want to reach people now to talk about your book, you might want to look at which medium is going to work best. Maybe Tumblr would work better for you. Tumblr is crazy making sometimes, but long form, well, you know, it's better if it's a picture of a girl, barefoot girl riding in her moleskin. You'll get more popular, you know, hearts for that. But in your case, if you want to post excerpts from it, there's all kinds of places. You could have a Q&A on Twitter, but the thing is, if you're doing something interesting, people are much likely, much more likely to show up. I mean, the, the, upside, the upsides are all still the same. The tools, particularly with print, which should have adopted this stuff long before music and, and, and film. You know, we're in a place now where a writer can write a thing and have a worldwide audience um, within an hour at a cost that is uh, negligible. This is an utter revolution far more than Gutenberg in terms of reaching people by print. There's a lot more, so that's still the upside. You can still reach that audience, you can still self-publish. The downside, I think, is what we're talking about is that there's so much noise um, that how do you get your signal through? And you know, t today I don't know that you could go on Twitter and, and say, "Oh, I have a novel," and like get people interested in. I think there's a great community at Goodreads. I don't, uh, do you know, Goodreads.com. I was surprised to find there's a really nice, active community. And I would say if you want to just do it in a way that doesn't make you feel like you want to murder yourself, um, find a community around something you like that feels new and active and not ruined yet by. Thousands of Ashton Kutcher Can I mention followers. one other thing also is, is that um, the, the whole thing of influence can be really overplayed because a lot of people are regarded as influential who are mainly just looked at by other influencers and topic leaders. But there's... there's Words there's, I don't understand. There's a big... There's a big and one thing that's I think some people get, like if they're a writer, is to say, oh, I, I need to just get my writing out there and get people to read it and then buy it, which is certainly true. But the other thing, and I don't, I don't think this has to be douchey, is that if you, if you really work to to directly reach the people that will enjoy what you do, they'll talk about it for you, and not just on social media. They'll tell their smart friends when they go out to lunch that you should check out this woman's book, because it's really cool. And to me, that's, that's the really effective networking part of it, yeah. is being, being a version of yourself that you can live with that convinces smart people that what you're doing is interesting. And if you keep doing, I, and this sounds condescending, but I think it really works. It's just people start out with the whole, like, what's my clout today? And I, don't, I think those people are going to be living under a couch within a year. Like, who cares? Yeah. You know, if it's, just, if it's just people in social media doing social media, social media, like, it's, it's, it's douchebags all the way down. But, but if you're able to get your stuff in front of smart people, they'll spread it for you, and you won't have to look at your cloud. We have a question back here from a man with a goatee and a white blazer. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, you talked a little bit about how oversaturated the uh, social media market is right now. What's the biggest challenge that uh, independent musicians especially face today? Uh, well, I think it's I think it's getting people it's getting people to to hear your stuff uh, is still is still the greatest challenge. Uh, uh, you know, p people have so many ways of uh, listening to music in this sort of uh, indirect way. Although that said, you know, I, I think that you can you the 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 negative is also the plus you know there are so many services out there so many different ways for people to listen but it's also relatively trivial for you to get your stuff up there and it's the same kind of thing you know you 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 put your music up uh in all these different places uh and you kind of hope for the best and you see if anything seems to be working for you 
uh, and you kind of push in in that direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, for for a musician, it's like you know, if you if you have never been a musician before and you have a new record, and now you're trying to get people to listen to it, that is the toughest thing in the world because there are a lot of records out there already, and that has always been the case, and, and that's and, not a new problem. And I think Merlin's point that uh, that it is still more valuable that five really smart, really uh, tasteful people like your music than it is that you that you get retweeted ten thousand times. The reason the reason I switched from Twitter to Tumblr to some degree was because Tumblr made it fun again. You're still I, trying to rationalize it. No, but I but I mean to say that you know if you find a community where you're having fun, like Jonathan's advice is make the best content you have, make sure that it's authentic and put it out there, authentic to your taste and good times. And if you find a community that is legitimately fun for you, where you can have fun with other people sharing your stuff, I think those people will go out there and share it with other people far more than if you throw it onto a massive social media uh, yeah. network that you don't respond to personally. I have a quick question for you guys, actually, who, who are you know who who are selling things online and using that to to do it. Um, uh, one of the things that Fifty Shades of Grey, that the hugely popular um, book, uh, fantastic used, book, great book, woo, fantastic. Woo, woo. Wait, got a woo. Jordan, Jordan called it mom bondage. Mom bondage, yeah. Um, that's there's no, that's not a pejorative. That's fine <laughs> by me. Um, Maybe enough for you. That's, um, if you want to talk in more detail about the plot of Fifty Shades of Grey after the show, I'll be available in Jonathan Colton's van. Um, the, I just want to say, I know we're actually, we're really long time, but, but forums are kind of secretly a really popular place for people to, uh, to find each other. And that's how it, I think the Twilight fan forums were that, where that really took off. Right, because with all this noise, people are desperate for filters that they can trust. And building small communities that they like. Yeah, and the filters that you can trust are your friends. And those are the people that you talk to in forums that you frequent. You know, it's, so we, it's, it's, and the, the biggest challenge for independent musicians, I think, is still the biggest challenge that we all face, is how how do we make a living doing this? And in, in a way, what this has enabled us to do is uh, Jonathan and I are both uh, uh, very attractive men in our 40s. And up until very recently, there was, no, uh, there was no world in which songwriters in their 40s could continue to not, not uh, fly around the world in a 707, but make, the, make a living equivalent to that of a small dental practice by writing songs. And what, what this has enabled us to do is uh, continue to make art and admittedly struggle to make a living, but actually make a living. That's your, that's your measure of success is an, an SDP, a small one, one small dental practice. <laughs> there, is... there, there, are, there are some people from high school that I still am very competitive with. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> You just want you want to get to like 1.2 SDP. You want to get 1.2 yeah. SDP. Yeah. When I when I get to four SDP, then huge, huge. Look out Did anyone world. have one last burning question that didn't get answered? Didn't have to be very quick. It would have to be the last question. All right. It's, I saw. There's two. a man right to your I right. Saw, yeah. Okay. What happened in LA with the Twitter feed? Did somebody come and get you? I didn't. I didn't hear that. Oh, in LA. What? In, no. Oh yeah, did someone come and get pick you up oh, when you? Oh, no, no, I don't you know, think I don't we, think we tweeted because he was afraid. I was afraid. I was like, "You're going to send out a message on the internet and people are going to come here." I don't want that at all. Yeah. So we walked. We walked to the place we and did got walk, the car. Yeah. It's very sad. It turned out the information was written on a sign that said, "Your car will be towed after 3 p.m. Call this number." We figured it out. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank our moderator, John Hodgman, uh, Jonathan Colton, Merlin Mann, Scott Simpson. Thanks, John Roderick. We are, we are performing tonight uh, at the Showbox Theater. Uh, it will be a, uh, an, an evening of uh, ribaldry and uh, music and dance. And what is the, the ticket uh, accommodation for people who are sick attendees? There are, there are some tickets uh, that come with your sick membership, uh, and I don't know what the deal is. Uh, that is a Do question. we have an answer for that? That's a question Anybody? to ask your, your hand. Look it up on the internet. Yeah. Platinum oh, holders. Oh, platinum holders are welcome to attend. Are welcome to attend free, free of, of charge. charge. Uh, uh, tickets and are, are twenty-five dollars. And semi-precious metal holders are asked yeah. politely to uh, stay home. No yeah. tin badges. If, if you are a gold member, you are, you, you are uh, You're priority garbage. boarding, but yeah. no first-class upgrade. We'd like to welcome our ten thousand mile members. Oops. Tickets are available at the door. Oh, tic tickets are available at the door. Platinum badge holders. 
are welcome to attend for free and sit on our laps during the entire show. Is there so. anything else you'd like to say, John Hodgman, before we cut your mic? No, that is all. <laughs> and we'll all be in uh, gorgeous tuxedos. Oh, that's right. We're, we're matching Chocolate tuxedos Brown. tonight. Thank you. Thank you.